So welcome. Uh, we're going to keep this super informal. Again, for those of you who haven't met, I'm Chris Casado, the co-founder of TSX Challenge. We organize inspirational backpacking trips for all ages and experience levels through the Sierra and the Grand Canyon. It's really great to have many of you here tonight who are going to be joining us on the trip. And so please use this like as your session to get as many questions answered, whether it be logistics, on the trail, about the route, anything you want to have answered. Let's make sure we talk about it tonight so that we can start mentally preparing, physically preparing, and getting ready to go. Hey, Eric, go ahead. Do you have a question? There's no audio, though, Eric. Let me ask you to unmute. Go ahead. How's that? Go ahead. Looks sounds good. Yeah, I'm not going on that trip. I'm just here to learn. Yep. Eric is going to be joining us on the Trans Sierra trip a little bit later. So, uh, Eric, a handful of these people have actually been on the Trans Sierra trip with you. I know at least Beth has that you're going to be going on and uh, ask her for questions. She'll give you the honest take. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, I'm back in the park here doing another 2,800 footer tomorrow morning. At Excellent. Um, so hopefully this helps. You guys can see this short presentation. I'm going to use this as a quick guide to lead the conversation. This is just a little bit about me. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. Other than like, you know, I've been backpacking this year for quite a while, you know, 25 plus years. First trip was to Mount Whitney back in 1994. Did the John Muir Trail, which I think a few of you are looking at or have done in the past, uh, which is a 200 mile route from Yosemite to Mount Whitney. And then uh, we started TSX just really on that initial trans Sierra route. We were just going to do that one route, do it really well, you know, the week long hike across the Sierra to Mount Whitney. And then some got introduced to the Grand Canyon. So we had a second route, the Grand Canyon, uh, which is a three night, four day trip that Lynn did back in the day. Thank you, Lynn, for being one of our early adopters. And then we had some people come back to us like, hey, Chris, where else can we go backpacking? So we introduced this area called Hell for Sure in 2017. This is as we just started turning this in from like hobby to more of a business and help for sure is an area that's kind of near and dear to my heart it's where i grew up not many people know about this area unless you're local like you know from the from the clovis fresno or central valley area uh and so we really love sharing it with other people part of the fun of sharing it is like taking people back to where i grew up this is clovis california clovis is in the heart of the central sierra and most of the trips that we do kind of in the sierra come in through clovis which is just a sister city of fresno but we're trying to put clovis on the map uh, Clovis is like the gateway to the Sierras or Sierra, however you want to say it. And if you look on the map, where is it? This is just a little bit of an orientation for yourself. Clovis is kind of right here near Fresno. Um, there's actually this other town called Shaver Lake, which is uh, just, you know, about an hour outside of Clovis. And this is where we have a small cabin. And we like to spend as much time up in Shaver Lake as possible. This is the central Sierra. So we're south of Yosemite, which is up here. And we are north of Kings Canyon and Mount Whitney, which is kind of down to the bottom here. So right in the middle of the Sierra, Shaver Lake looks like this in the full moon. Absolutely beautiful, 5,600 feet. Hopefully when you guys come up, we're gonna have a time to, to take you by Shaver Lake or maybe after the trip, uh, we'll get a bite to eat in Shaver Lake um, to kind of top things off. <clears throat> um, actually, if you look from Shaver Lake, right below where that moon is hanging, there's a peak and that peak is called Bald Mountain. And if you go to the top of Bald Mountain, it looks like this. And now this is the top looking back down towards Shaver Lake. Um, why am I telling you all this? Well, it's, it's nice to kind of know the orientation. So here's Shaver Lake, here's Bald Mountain. I love to take the kids up there. It's a nice seven mile hike up to the uh, seven mile round trip up and back, kind of a rugged uh, four wheel drive type terrain. <clears throat> Incredibly enough, that lake that you see in the background, Shaver Lake, used to have a flume that went all the way from Shaver Lake down to Clovis. And when they think flume, it is literally old school flume, right? This is one of the largest flumes in this year. I have 40 plus miles where they would float logs into the, into the lake, float them down the flume. And then there was a lumber mill down in Clovis. They take care of and, 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 you know, transition the, the, the wood there. So pretty incredible. Just like the history, this no longer, these structures no longer exist, but just for perspective. Now I've had all different types of people. I like to push it a little bit, help different people, different age groups, reach high peaks, including young kids like this. But when you get to Bald Mountain, if you look in the distance back there, you can see these white capped peaks, right? This is the fun stuff. This is where we're gonna go. If I were to like zoom way out there in this far distance from Bald Mountain, this is Mount Goddard. And you can actually see Mount Goddard from Highway 5 or Highway 99 in the Central Valley. Like this is right there for you to kind of like see and enjoy. If I were to kind of like, this is actually a shot in September. So this was like, a, I think it was like mid-September when this was taken, the very first snowstorm. Mount Goddard sits around 13,000 feet. 
Hopefully it looks going to look more like this when we're out there. <clears throat> now, so, couple... so you, Chris, you can see Mount Goddard from uh, Bald, Bald Mountain. You can. And how high is Bald Mountain elevation? Uh, I want to say 7,000. 56. Okay. So not very high, but okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. It's, it's one of those peaks out there. You can see Bald Mountain from, I mean, you, see, you can see Mount Goddard from driving like, you know, Fresno Clovis, Madera area. So it's, mm -hmm. it's hanging up above the Sierra. Um, this is Mount Goddard kind of up close. This is at Martha Lake. And Martha Lake is oh, one of the most incredible, like it feels otherworldly type lakes. There are 40 million people who live in California. Most of them have no idea this lake even exists or this area even exists. And I, we were up there last year fishing, golden trout. It was amazing. It was absolutely beautiful. I, but last year, actually, there was a ton of snow. And one thing we're going to see how this summer plays out is there was so much snow last year that it, it, it's hanging over to this year as well. And this year was actually a pretty good 100% snow year. So there's going to be quite a bit of snow still kind of like in the Sierra. And we'll just see how the heat, wave work, heat waves work this summer to see how that snow melt works out. And that may impact kind of like the difficulty of reaching the summit of a mountain like this, Mount Goddard. Um, for your reference, just to kind of orient yourself more geography for this area, so there's a road that kind of takes you up to Shaver Lake. Shaver Lake is kind of like this crux right here where like it, it splits. In addition, there's a handful of other lakes that kind of dot this central Sierra area. There's Huntington Lake, which is to the north. There's a nice ski resort at Huntington Lake called China Peak. Florentin Edison Lake. Florentin Edison Lake are actually access points to the John Muir Trail. You have Wishon and Court Reservoir. These are out off of uh, the... Courtright Road or Dinky Creek Road that goes out of Shaver. <clears throat> and so this is kind of like the area that we have to work with. We're going to be starting our trips out of Courtright Reservoir for the Helfrischer and Mount Goddard trips. For the Tehipti Valley trip that we do, um, which we do in the spring and the fall, we start out of Wishon. And just so for reference, kind of like where we are, kind of the southern half of the Central Sierra area. There's Bald Mountain. And just for perspective, here's Wishon Reservoir, which is kind of the lower reservoir. With Sean and Courtright are actually connected. It's uh, managed by pg &E, and it's like a pump hydro project where they'll flow water down when the price of energy is expensive, generate electricity, and they'll pump it back up when the price of energy is cheap. Kind of think of it like a giant battery. Um, we're going to be starting at the upper reservoir, Courtright Reservoir. And Courtright Reservoir is around 8,200 feet, and that's going to be kind of our put-in point for this year. Beautiful, high granite, uh, beautiful domes. Not many people make it back to court, right? And I'll show you why there, there's a reason. Um, this is kind of, again, the geography layout here. Now there's something that's kind of prominent that I want you guys to take a look at. Much of you guys can see kind of on the, the lower half, there's kind of like this big, kind of this mountain range down here. Maybe this will, you can see it right here now. You see this, this range? This is called the Leconte Divide. This is where we're going to be headed to. This is the playground, the fun area that we're going to, you can think about like a big kid's playground. Um, not many people know about the Leconte Divide or where it's at or how to access it, but this is where we're going and we're going to kind of work our trips into in and out of. The reason it's kind of off the map is if you're a local from Clovis Fresno or the Central Valley, you know, you're one hour to Yosemite, an hour and a half, roughly speaking, to Sequoia Kings Canyon, two hours to make it back to Courtright Reservoir, where we're going to start our trip. But if you're coming from the San Francisco area where most of the population is, or LA, um, you know, the miles, the, the, the number of hours it takes is so much more difficult to get back to Court Reservoir, for, right? Now you're five or six hours back. Much easier just to go to Yosemite, much easier to go to up 395, go up Bishop on the Eastern Sierra. Um, so not many people know where this is. In summary, just to kind of get you excited, why is this so special? Like, A, I have a personal connection to it. So hopefully this is coming out in the talk. B, it's very remote and it's absolutely beautiful and a ton of fun. So I'm gonna pause there for a second and see if there's any questions and then we'll kind of walk you through some of the excitement of what you might be able to see when you're on these routes. Do you ever run into uh, other groups up there? We do on occasion uh, on the Hell for Sure loop, mainly the first couple of days. Uh, some of the locals know the area and there is one outward bound group that goes out there on occasion that we see. But outside of that, we don't see many people. I would say we could usually, the number of people we see, we can count on two hands.
Cool. Well, you guys keep questions as, as they come. I'm going to just talk a little bit more about the client divide and these routes and how we built them into it and why these are so special. So this is kind of like your aerial view here. And for those of you who know the John Muir Trail, Evolution Valley cuts right up kind of the backside here. Uh, you can see it right here, Evolution Valley. And in the foreground here, this is the LeConte Divide. Um, some orientation that takes you into the LeConte Divide. There's a couple trails, but they all pretty much dead end, more or less. There's a trail that goes up into Red Mountain Basin, which we use for um, our kind of entry point into this area. There's a trail that goes into something called Bench Valley, and this is what we use to create the Hell for Sure loop that we have. There's a trail that goes into Black Cat Basin, and we use this as an exit trail for our Hell or Mount Goddard uh, loop. And then there's a trail that goes farther around towards Tehipity and up towards Blue Canyon. I haven't personally made it all the way back to Blue Canyon yet, but I'm hoping to do that potentially later this summer. Uh, in addition, kind of sitting behind Mount Goddard is, or behind the Leconte Divide is Mount Goddard. It kind of towers over this divide. Roughly speaking, the Leconte Divide has kind of 12 to 13-ish foot thousand peaks, just below 13, and Goddard sits around 13.5. It kind of sits above them. Now, if you were to make your way into these different basins, Red Mountain Basin, Bench Valley, Black Cat Basin, you might see something like this. This is Hellforsher Lake. So this is the, the namesake, namesake lake. We didn't, we didn't name this out of like a, a painful discussion, like we're going to go, you know, have a really hard time. This is the name of the lake. I think they named it like this on purpose because it's so beautiful. Keep people away. Uh, actually, it's right <laughs> next to Hellforsher Pass. And if you ever come down Hellforsher Pass on the other side, there's a reason they probably called it Hellforsher Pass. So this is Hellforsher Lake. And this is Mount Hutton, a big 12,000 foot peak that kind of sits right behind it. This is Fleming Lake. Excellent fishing at Fleming Lake. In fact, on the Hellforsher route, we're going to pass more than a dozen High Sierra Lakes. This is Disappointment Lake, never disappoints. You have Horseshoe Lake as well. And for Amanda and Karen and Gary, sometimes we have these days where, depending on the group, we see if we can jump in four different lakes all in one day. So it depends how aggressive you want to be. Um, we can kind of get, uh, this is Arctic Lake, kind of has its own little moraine, sits on the back just below Mount Hutton. And then here's kind of another shot at Hellforsher Lake. Now we've been up there in all different types of environments. This is kind of a typical summer, I, I would say early summer view. You can see there's still snow. Um, back in 2019, we had a, a super aggressive hike up there. We were up there in early July and 2019 was a big snow year. It looked like this. The lake was still frozen over. We're not expecting this this summer for our trips. Um, on the other side of this ridge line, however, is Bench Valley. And Bench Valley is honestly one of my favorite spots in the entire Sierra, right up there with Colby Lake Beth. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is Schoolworm Lake. Uh, and Schoolworm Lake is just a gorgeous lake. This is about three or four miles off trail now. Uh, we can sit there and like sight cast and, and fish all day long and just enjoy it. There's actually a chain of about five or six lakes that stick up above this ridge line that you can go and have fun and, and play with. So um, Scrumman Lake is a great place to be. We try and spend as much time there as possible. In addition, you have great peaks like this that we go and take care of on the Help for Sure trip. So this is Red Mountain. Not many people know about Red Mountain. It's a 12,000 foot peak, but it has one of the most outsized views, uh, in my opinion, in the Sierra. It's a hiker's mountain. So anyone who kind of really wants it can make it happen. But when you get to the top, you have incredible views that look a little bit like this. We are at the right mountain. And that, that just happens to be my brother, Denver. Uh, who was out there on the hike with me. So this is, it was a cool trip to be out there with him. Um, this is a kind of perspective of like Red Mountain Basin, Hell for Sure, and Bench Valley. Or, so let me tell you a little bit why this is so cool. There's not really a trail that connects these two basins. In fact, uh, I, have, I kind of knew Red Mountain Basin. Um, I knew Bench Valley. And when we first started putting Hell for Sure together, I thought it wouldn't be cool if we can kind of connect these two beautiful basins because there's a trail that goes into one, a dead ends, a trail that goes in the other and goes over a pass. But what if we connect these two together? So it took me a little time to figure out this route. 
In fact, it took me two tries. Uh, the first time we came up, uh, we did Red Mountain. So I, here you can see all the lakes as you can, they kind of dot around here that we talked about. We make our way up on this ridge line, and this is going to be our path for Karen and Gary. Um, after we camp at or near Hellfresher Lake, we're actually probably going to camp um, on this area between Arctic Lake and Hellfresher Lake on this kind of little granite um, knoll, I would say. Then we're going to make our way up. This is all off trail up onto the Leconte Divide. And we'll be walking literally on the ridge line. It might look or feel a little bit like this. Here we are looking at the ridge line, and it almost looks like there's a pass there, the easiest way to go. Unfortunately, that's not the easiest way to go. Um, we've tried to get to this pass a couple of times. It was too steep, too dicey, didn't feel right. We actually came back down. It got kind of cold, and we ended up going back home the first time I tried this. Uh, the second attempt, we were a little bit more successful. This is the first attempt here. We were kind of back down at Horseshoe Lake camping. On the second attempt, I took a younger, younger friend from the Clovis Fresno area, and we created a new route that just goes um, literally over this knob and it has a great feeling, looks a little bit like this. So as we're gonna make our way up Hellfresher, um, around Hellfresher Lake, uh, there's a couple of little obstacles, I would say. The first one is what we call the hoist, where you might need a hand up. This is gonna be a team effort to like help people up on these ledges. Here we go again, it's kind of, kind of the hoist. Eventually we get our way onto the ridge line and we're looking straight at this knob and you can kind of see this knob right here. Um, the route that we choose to make it as easy as possible is going literally straight over the top of this knob. If you go to the left of it, it's a little bit too dicey and it kind of cliffs out. If you go to the right of it, too bouldery, too steep. So we create a path that literally goes right over the top. Um, it's not an intuitive path, so we take our time and do it together. There's something we call the stomp. And we call something the shimmy, where you're kind of shimmying around some rocks. But the views are incredible. And then it culminates, Gary, with this area we call the hustle, which is kind of a quick um, scurry up a little bit of a ramp. And if some reason it doesn't feel comfortable, we'll take your pack for you. We'll help you out. We'll make you get, help you get there. But eventually, we're going to have the whole group on top of the knob. At 12,000 feet, you're going to feel like you're on top of the world. Great views as far as the eye can see. Um, for most people, this is probably the highlight and one of the most thrilling experiences they have on, on this trip. Uh, making it to the top of the knob is, is, is pretty awesome, friends or family. And then from there, it's very much a walk off, an easy walk down, some smooth granite on the backside. So for those of you kind of looking at the help for sure route, this is roughly speaking the elevation profile. And it's about six or eight miles off travel, depending on how much exploration we want to do when we're out there. Um, you can kind of see the first big peak and rise here. This is Red Mountain. And the second big rise and peak, this is the knob. So this is kind of like the two big um, quote unquote passes, not passes per se, but the two big high points of the Helfrischer loop. And it looks a little bit like this here. What, what is the longest distance between uh, for a water stop? There's water going to be, there's going to be water everywhere. Be, there's water every 45 minutes to two hours. So cool. you won't need to carry more than one to two liters at any given time. Yeah, there's plenty of water on this entire route. Cool. So switching gears, like that's kind of the hell of a sure loop. And when you get out there, um, there's these incredible mountains. There's uh, Mount Henry, which sits on kind of the, the far northern terminus of the Silicon Divide. There's Red Mountain which we saw a little bit of in this last slide, a couple of slides. There's uh, the knob at Mount Hutton, which is sitting above Hellfrischer Lake. Uh, Mount Reinstein, which is uh, you know pushing closer to 12,000, 13,000 feet, uh, which sits a little bit farther south. And then there's something called Finger Peak. All of these are great mountains. And then Mount Goddard again sits behind it. And just to give you a, a snapshot of what these mountains look like, uh, here's Mount Henry from the west. Mount Reinstein from the east. That's Martha Lake seen down below it. You can kind of see Finger Peak in the background there sticking out. This is in Black Cat Basin. And then this is Mount Goddard. And this is the view of Mount Goddard as you're coming down from Red Mountain. So just for perspective again, okay, um, there's a number of passes that take you in and out of like the Lacan Divide. And we're going to use a few of them. There's Hellfrischer Pass, Gunsight Pass, Confusion Pass, 
uh, and Valor Pass. And <clears throat> some of them are a little easier than others. Hellforsure Pass, uh, from our perspective, looks like this. So here's the lake and there's the pass. It's actually a pretty nice, easy little walk, maybe about 35 minutes to walk up the top. No pressure, beautiful hike, great views. Gunsight Pass, which sits above Schoolmarm Lake, um, kind of looks like that gunsight there. A little more challenging. I've been up there. It's a great view. It's amazing. Um, next to Gunsight Pass, if you're looking at it from the east, is something called Confusion Pass. Uh, Confusion Pass is right next to Confusion Lake. I think they named it Confusion Lake because it has an outlet that goes both into the Kings River and the San Joaquin River, depending on its, you know, how full it gets. Um, and then in Confusion Pass is um, something that we kind of are going to use as a way to get back into uh, Black Hat Basin. Uh, in fact, we actually create a new pass we call like Confusion Pass 2.0 or the wall, which goes over this ridge line right here. So we're actually going to be a little bit higher than Confusion Lake. This is for Beth and those looking at the Mount Goddard route. Uh, when you drop over the Lacan Divide, this is what Goddard Canyon looks like. And Goddard Canyon is the headlands of the San Joaquin River. The San Joaquin River is the river that flows all the way from the Sierra through the Central Valley out to the mouth of the Bay Area. So this is where it all starts. In fact, it starts literally, literally at Mount Goddard. Uh, this is the upper half of Goddard Canyon. It's absolutely beautiful. Great views. Uh, not many people, I hardly ever see a soul back there. This is Martha Lake. And then for Lynn, the, now we're going to talk a little bit more about kind of a route to Mount Goddard. So here is Mount Goddard that sits just above Martha Lake. And the route we're going to use is something called the Southeast Chute. The Southeast Chute, actually, you can't see it from this angle. It's around kind of the crease on the right. And then back up, the chute sits behind it. The chute kind of tops out um, where the little yellow line comes back in right here. And then the last little bit is a walk along the ridge, roughly speaking, to the summit. And it might look like this in the morning, Lynn, for waking up. Um, we'll camp, typically speaking, uh, on this side of the lake, and then we'll make our way around the lake and start to work our way up. As you work your way up, there's a kind of a talus and scree that's kind of littered across, but there is a light use trail. So if you kind of keep your mind and your bearings, um, you know, as you're coming up, let me see if I can give you a shot for you here, Liz. Keeping this ridge line in mind, if you're kind of shooting for going above kind of the face, this lower face right here, um, you will eventually see a small yeast trail. And that yeast trail will take you up and around this ridge. That yeast trail disappears on occasion. Sometimes it's there depending on the rock slides and stuff like that. But generally speaking, you can get a feel for it. Eventually, we cross over a small gully. And then the trail quite literally works our way up into, uh, I would say trail is probably not the right word. The route we use works our way up uh, into this, the top of this wash the top of this debris field. At the top, it looks a little bit like this. We had our own little calving glacier here. Uh, this is back in 2019, I believe. Here's a shot kind of coming out of there. And then eventually we work our way around the corner and we end up looking at something called the Southeast Chute. And this is what that route looks like coming up the Southeast Chute. Sometimes there is a snow field. Last year, there was a massive snow field. I should update these slides, but this was just completely um, caked in. And we ended up turning back around. We did not summit last year because it ended up being a very much of a technical ascent and it was kind of rainy and snowy and we decided let's just play it safe. This year though, I think our odds are pretty great to um, have a great ascent and, and enjoy it. There may be some snow out there, but we're gonna work our way right along the ridge line on the Southeast chute and make our way towards the summit. And as you approach the summit, here's the Southeast chute kind of on a clean, no snow year or lower snow year. As you make your way to the ridge line, it looks like this, the, the peaks just start popping up all around you. Um, eventually we'll be looking into something called, uh, this is now looking at the Black Hat Basin. You can kind of see a gentleman here in the red on the ridge line. This gentleman actually was Jan. Jan was 76 years old and he summited Mount Goddard two days before his 77th birthday, which <laughs> is incredible. He had done, this was a, his seventh trip that he did with us. So he was a very active backpacker. But summoning Mount Goddard is, is an incredible feeling. It's about kind of reaching that goal, you know, having it, having success as a team because it definitely is a team effort. And then the view from Mount Goddard, I think, is is incredible and unparalleled. It's that airplane type view. You typically have the entire mountain to yourself. 
And it's a hiker's mountain. You don't have to do any climbing. You just have to do some, you know, some hard work and some high determination to get there. And it feels a little bit like this. So small taste of, of what it feels like to be up there. It's a very quiet morning. <clears throat> On our exit, as we come down, you have a uh, Valor Pass, which is one idea I was looking at when we first started building this route. It's a little bit high for my take. Um, we decided we we're gonna come back and create our own route. So we call this Confusion Pass 2.0, or more affectionately, we call it the wall. Um, there's kind of a little river ramp we take up, make a traverse, and then one more climb. As you approach the wall, it looks a little bit like this. And this is definitely a team effort. For many people, this is among, this is probably the most challenging part of the trip because we do the wall the same day we do Mount Goddard. So we summit Mount Goddard, come back to Martha Lake, turn around and go back over the wall, almost like a big half pipe. Um, here's what it looks like kind of working your way up onto the wall. Sometimes it takes a team effort if people aren't feeling very comfortable. Eventually we work our way on, back onto the ridge line and incredibly enough, despite all those challenges, we do have people who managed to take these incredible Instagram shots and beauty shots. Here's a shot of Annie. She's been on, I think, eight or nine of our trips. And here she has the hair flip picture right here with Mount Goddard staring in the background, which I, I love. But whatever your driving force is, whether it's the, <laughs> the Instagram shot or just that time away, there is no email. There's no internet. There's no cell phone. It's just you and some absolutely raw, rugged beauty of the Sierra. And uh, I kind of have goosebumps coming through my little sweater here. Uh, I'm in the Bay Area. That's why it's a little cooler. Goosebumps coming through just to share these guys, share this with you guys. Here's a picture of Black Cat Basin as we kind of enter, uh, kind of exit the, the higher, higher elevations. And this is Lightning Corral Meadow down below. And eventually in the final night on the trip, we typically spend it right along the North Fork of the Kings River. Just a beautiful, relatively slow moving river, lots of pools for swimming, some slides, great for fishing as well. And um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. So the, this trip has had an incredibly positive impact on me and, and my family and, and lots of people in our community. And I hope it can have an equally, impact, an equally positive impact on you guys and your friends and family. And I'm grateful for you guys to come out with us and hopefully it gives you the inspiration that can last a lifetime. Couple shots we have out there. This young gentleman was 13 years old out there on the Hell for Sure loop. We've actually had nine year olds, nine and 10 year olds on the Hell for Sure trip as well. <clears throat> Here for the elevation profile, this is what the Mount Goddard route would look like. So you can kind of see the big peak here is Hell for Sure Pass. And then we go over to Mount Goddard. And then we have one more climb over Confusion Pass 2.0 or the wall before we make our way back down. And here's kind of the loop again. So just as a reminder, for those of you who are joining us, we try and make it really easy for people with kind of limited or no skills to backpack this year. I would say the Hell for Sure loop is more forgiving. It's a great place to start. The Mount Goddard loop is one for people who want to like kind of stretch the imagination of what's possible um, for those experienced, more, a little bit more experienced backpackers. Although if you are highly motivated and in shape, you're totally welcome to join us on Mount Goddard as well. We'd love to have you out there. We have had a handful of first-time backpackers on Mount Goddard. They loved it, they crushed it, and they came back again. So we take care of the permits. If you need a backpack, sleeping bag, or tent, provide that for you. Take care of all the group gear, all the cooking, transportation, put you guys with lots of love and experience on the trips. Uh, <clears throat> all you really need is your personal items, positive attitude, sense of adventure. The dates we have remaining with space available on our Health Assurance Mount Goddard trips, I think we have five or six trips planned, and there are three trips that have some space remaining. So we have a handful of spots on the 20th to 25th for Health Assure. We have one spot remaining on the Hell for Sure, the 3rd to the 8th. And then I think we have a handful of spots remaining on the Mount Goddard trip as well. So <clears throat> more information can be found here on our website, tsxchallenge.com. Shoot me an email, send me a text, follow us on Instagram, social media, uh, Facebook if it is. Uh, we do organize a handful of, uh, I'd say the Hell for Sure loop is one of our most popular routes for doing private customized trips. So if you're looking for like a, a private trip for your friends or family or something like that, 
this is an excellent place to do it. And we'd love to have you out there. We call it our TSX pods, which is like our private customized trips. So reach out to us and we're currently scheduling trips for 2025. Um, we kind of live in the number of permits and we'd love to have you out with us. And with that, I will open up for questions and say thank you guys for joining and we'll go from there. Chris? Yes. Well, how cold is it? I'm going to be on the Hell for Sure trip in August. How cold does it get? So this is like summer backpacking in the Sierra. And I would say expect highs in the you know, 60s to 80s, depending on the elevation or what might happen. And lows are typically in the you know high 30s to low 40s. Mm -hmm. Although it can, we can get freezing temperatures on occasion, depending mm -hmm. on the weather system. But typically mm -hmm. high 30s, low 40s in the summer at, at high elevations. And then mm -hmm. 50, 60, high 50s, 60s, 70s is pretty typical at high elevations for the highs. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I haven't been that high before. I haven't been, I've been up to 10,000, but I haven't been um, as high as like Bald Mountain or Red Mountain. So. Okay. Cool. Well, now's the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'm excited. I'm excited. No problem. Thanks for the question. More questions? Hey, Chris, Go ahead. Chris, Dave, uh, I just had some questions about the food. Um, I had, when I filled out the form, I, I mentioned some crazy diet restrictions I have. And uh, in general, if you can kind of run down the food, that'd be great. Sure. So we take all of our own, uh, we make all of our own meals and everything is kind of modular. So we're pretty good about accommodating different dietary restrictions. I would say that, you know, one comment we have for our trips is we try and go light on our gear and we do splurge a little bit on our food. We, we take stuff that we'd like to eat that's a little bit healthier and that we enjoy. So it's not uncommon for us to pull out vegetables on day four, day five, or, you know, some other types of meats that we've kind of created in our own special way to, to make a, a good flavorful meal. I would say we eat well, but we're also, every, there's nothing that's prepackaged. So it's not like we're pulling something off a shelf out of a big box store. We create everything on our own. It's all kind of separated. If you have a serum glucose allergy or a gluten or a gluten allergy, or maybe a lactose or onions or whatever it might be, we're pretty good about being able to add and subtract to make sure you're taken care of. If you have some other special diets that you really know are important to you, if you want to bring a few meals on your own that are like, Hey, you know, I know a couple of these meals aren't going to work. Let me know, David, I'll be glad to share the meal plan with you. And you can kind of identify those and we can make a plan together. Okay. That sounds good. Cool. Chris, David's on our, um, help for sure in August. Hike. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. David, let, let me, you know, shoot me an email and I'll be glad maybe a week or two before we'll just kind of review it together and make sure we're dialed in or let me, I'll, I'll take a look at your profile as well to make sure that I got to feel for it and reach out if needed. Sounds uh, good. Yeah, David's also responsible for me getting into backpacking. So uh -oh. I blame, I blame him for that. Awesome. <laughs> uh, you know, so, one more, do we need to bring a, oh. It's all good. She's, she said, no. go ahead. Go ahead, Karen. Do we need to bring a, a bear canister for our private, our own bear canister for like toothpaste and stuff like that? We take care of it. We have the bear cans. We'll have enough room to, to store Just the snacks. There's stuff in at night. Okay. Items okay. Items. Okay. Yeah. okay. Wow. Chris, you had mentioned. What's the sweet spot on how many people for your individual um, trips or your private family? Custom trips? Private. Yeah. Yeah. We, four people. Four people four or more. People? Yeah. Okay. Chris, you had mentioned fishing. If you bring a reel, do we have to secure an independent permit or do you need a permit to fish in those alpine lakes? Uh, yes. Technically, the answer is yes. Yes. So do you secure the permit for us or do we have to get uh, the you, permit? You can, pick, you can pick up a California fishing license and Shaver Lake on the way up if you like. Gotcha. Okay. Chris, can you can you hear me? Yes, like in New York. Can you get a, a, I'm going to be staying overnight in, in Clovis the, the day before August 2nd there. Yeah, there's a, there's fishing, there's sports shops there. I can go in the morning and get a, a license, eh? Yes. There, probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I have a burning question that has nothing to do with the trips itself, but from watching you, the video on you, how to load your backpack, I noticed you only had one trekking pole and it's been burning in my mind there do you always trek with one pole or is it just a personal preference or is there a specific reason so i don't typically use trekking poles uh most of the time i will use a trekking pole for a stream crossing 
or snowfield or maybe like an intense downhill section on occasion. That's my personal preference. Uh, maybe in the Grand Canyon, I will say I do use one trekking pole more often. Uh, so, but for some reason, I just use one. I'm not sure why. That's just how I operate. I'm not used to using trekking poles. I'm not that coordinated with two hands. I would say most people swear by their trekking poles. So I would encourage people to bring them. Um, oh, that's just I my know. personal but preference. And that's I always need, need the trekking poles. Yeah. It, it's because Chris is still a, still a child. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I don't think they'll ever change. Yeah. Um, Chris and Clovis, do you still have like um, there? I think we stayed in a Best Western or something last time, and there was a special rate or something. Do you have special rates there again? I don't. So we have a special rate in the Grand Canyon uh, at the place you stay for the Grand Canyon. We don't have a special oh, okay. rate in Clovis at the moment. Okay. I'll just get a room. I, I have another question, Chris. Yeah. Um, because I'm fly, I'm flying from Montreal into San Francisco, and then from from San Fran to Fresno, staying in Fresno. My plan is to because I like to use all my own stuff, but I'm worried if they're going to lose it. So my plan is to just put the stuff that you would supply in my suitcase and all my personal stuff in a carry on. So if they lose the, that, then I could I can use your tent and backpack and so on. Is there room in in the van that we'd be taking to to store the suitcase, the empty suitcase, um, or should I make arrangements with the hotel or something? Uh, we can make arrangements for you. So Eric, for your trip on the Trans Sierra route, everyone will bring it. Like everyone's going to have at least one small bag with them, like a ch clean, change of clean clothes. Um, and all of that will typically stay in the van. So for your trip, we typically have two trucks, a van and a truck that go up together. There's plenty of space. We'll be able to take care of it. We'll bring it back. An empty, an empty, an empty big suitcase because I'm going to put the backpack in the suitcase. This, that's my plan because I don't trust them not to wreck the, this, the backpack yeah. without just loose. We'll, yeah. We'll take care of it okay. and we'll make sure it's taken care of. Right, Thanks. Well, I enjoyed watching that. Awesome. Well, I enjoyed chatting with you guys. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. Um, this is like an hour vacation without any kids or anything else going on. I'm not making dinner right now. So this is great. Although I'm going to go make dinner some <laughs> in a few minutes. but <laughs> uh, And then off to other activities. But um, if you guys have more questions, comments, ideas, shoot me, shoot us a text, send us an email. Um, we do have a few spots open for those of you now that you have an idea of what you're actually doing. Maybe you have other friends or family who might want to join you. We'd love to have them out with us. And... Lynn, if you have more questions for your own personal trips to Mount Goddard, let me know. I'm happy to share as much as I can. Or we can talk more or you're always welcome to join us. Okay. So. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much.